So hello everyone. Uh, so this talk is actually, or it used to be a talk about um, a concurrency, like an implementation, a concurrent implementation of like this. Okay, cool. Um, it used to be a walk through a normal uh, Rust application to something that could run concurrently, and I extended it for for LambdaCon and, and added some, uh, how to say, uh, more functional concepts to it. Uh, so Roslang is not a secret. Roslang is, is a, uh, it's not a pure functional language, although it does have a lot of uh, functional concepts in it, and the type system itself uh, works pretty closely as you would expect it to work in a functional language. So that's what I'm going to focus on today. Um, in, my, in my original proposal, I, I mentioned a lot of things like, uh, we're gonna uh, you know, give you some uh, functional implementations and functional examples of, of how you can use Rustlang as a functional language and all that kind of things. Uh, however, I, I decided to just like leave some of those things aside and explain you how uh, how Roslang uses a linear type system to uh, guarantee safety in the language itself so that you don't have to depend on any other things like garbage collection or, uh, or doing it yourself, you know, like using a dynamic language, a dynamic type system um, where you have to take care of all those things yourself. So the, the compiler does everything for you and it does it uh, using a linear type system or a fine types if, if that's more familiar to you. So that's what, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Let's see if I have enough time. So before we get there, some disclaimers. Uh, I normally speak very fast. If I'm going too fast, just raise your hand and I'll slow down, definitely. And I, I normally rant a lot. I don't think I'm going to rant today because I don't have anything to rant about. However, I do say bad words, so don't take it on me. Um, I'm, I really don't know what's, what the fuck is wrong with me, but I normally say bad words when I'm, uh, I'm speaking, so nothing personal. Um, and well, like I said, like I have many things to say, and if, 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 you, if you have any questions, just feel free to raise your hand and interrupt me. I'm, I'm very happy to answer all those questions. And okay, there's the image. So that's me. Uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, to raise your hand at any time. I'll happily answer them. I prefer to answer them while I'm speaking instead of just going back and forth on my slides at the end of the talk. So please, let's make sure we are all on the same page while we're talking. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, so go ahead. Yes, sir. You will be surprised. Um, well, as far as I know. Oh, I'm the only one who worded enough to get an alias on his email address so that we will be Flavio at Red Hat and it will be simpler for everyone. Uh, so that's my email address. And if you have any questions or you have any feedback for me about this talk or anything else, feel free to send me an email. I'll happily reply to you and, and we can have we can have definitely constructive conversations over email or over Twitter if you want to follow me, feel free to do it. I'm still working at Red Hat and, and I don't think I'm going anywhere anytime soon. So uh, yeah, and I do something completely different. Like I don't even, uh, I don't work on this field. I'm not an expert on functional, on the functional field or even uh, programming languages themselves. I love them, I like to work on them and Roslang is, is one of the projects I work on when I'm not uh, actually doing actual work or I should say the other way around. I, that Rosalind is a project I work on, and when I'm not working on Rust, I normally do some actual work. And so yeah, this is not my main field. I, I work on OpenStack full day, so that's Python. That's completely different from what we're going to talk about today. However, uh, like I said, I love programming languages, and I definitely love Rust, and I'm having a lot of fun on it. So let's get to it. So what's up with this Rosalind thingy that uh, some people have been talking about? I'm, I'm not expecting you all to, to know how Rosalind works. Uh, so I'm giving you a really brief introduction to Roslang. Roslang started as a personal project from a guy called uh, Graydon Nohar, and, and he, he started it as a hobby. And then at Mozilla, they had a need to recreate, for some reason, um, well, if you use Firefox, you know why they are recreating it. So they are recreating the, the Gecko engine, you know? Like, they're, they are recreating it from scratch using a concurrent language, and they didn't have a language that would uh, that would be good for that job. So they decided to take this, uh, this project that had some promises on it and, and they decided to fund it and, and start working on it. So they took the project, they made it themselves. And, and well, that's, that's Roslang today. Uh, it's been there for a long time. Great on the heart does not work on Roslang anymore. He moved over. Uh, but there's an amazing team, there's an amazing community behind it. And even though, I mean, even if Mozilla would, have, would stop funding it, I, I believe the project would leave it by itself and by the community. 
uh, that would keep it alive. So does it buy me anything? Uh, that really depends. Oh, this is the best excuse ever. I love to use it. It depends on the context. It depends on what you're working on. Uh, but if you come from a uh, high-level uh, layer, a high-level environment or application kind of language, and, and, and you love system languages as well, so Roslang is, is a step you take forward or after you have suffered enough with C++ or C, and, and it gives you enough control and power to do everything that you do with your high level language, or even the things you do with other functional languages. Not all of them, and we'll see why in a bit. So, what does it have to do with functional language? Like I said, it's not a pure functional language. It doesn't even have high, uh, higher kind of types anyway. So, uh, will, we, will it have higher kind of types? Probably in the future. There are plans, there are many people interested in it. There are some other fees that have been written. Uh, no decision has been made yet, but uh, those might come in the future. However, it has a lot of functional in it uh, that goes beyond just having, you know, first citizen, uh, first, uh, first order functions or things that you can pass around and just using functions to program. It has a lot of in it, uh, of functional in, in, its, in its type system. Uh, if you have read anything about Roslang, I'm pretty sure you were stumped by all the sigils it used to have. And know that I said it used to have. It does not have those sigils anymore. Uh, it just has uh, two kind of uh, pointers. And one of them is to take a reference to some value. And the other one is to, is what we call the unsafe pointer or the raw pointer. And it's the one that we do not, like the compiler does not control by itself. So you can basically uh, do raw accesses to the memory without any kind of control. So remember the whole point, I mean, one of the main goals about Roslang is providing safety. It's guarantee safety for the user, for the people that are using the language and, and programming with it. And so this is the main goal, so it's very important for, for the compiler. And we used to have those uh, sigils. The first one was for uh, something that you might be familiar with, like a smart pointer in C++ or unique pointers uh, that are, are allocated in the heap. So we used to have that sigil for that. That's gone. That has been converting something that is uh, actually representing the type system itself, and this this already shows uh, the power of the the type system. And the second one was to express something that would be garbage collect. Uh, the, the the language used to have some internal garbage collection, and and we like at some point the core team decided to just move that away and leave a library to do that. And saying that a library can do garbage collection for you already says a lot about the type system. It just expresses you and just tells you that the type system is powerful enough to let you know when something needs to be garbage collect. And you can also have different implementations of it. The type system, the compiler itself, will give you enough information to know uh, when something needs to be cleaned up. And in fact, we already have some implementation of those uh, garbage collectors, like very simple reference counted garbage collectors, uh, where you can just wrap a value pass it around, and, and as, as soon as it just goes out of references, it will be cleaned up. It, has immu it is immutable by default. You can have things that are mutable, but by default, it is immutable everywhere. We use our AII, and you probably know this from C++. This is our way to just know when something needs to be, uh, to, uh, when, when a memory needs to be freed up, and as soon as something goes out of scope, it will be cleaned up from memory. And this is the same way as, uh, as C++ does it. And the name is probably the most confusing name ever to name anything, but that's one of the problems we have in computer science anyway. So almost everything is an expression. We just have two statements. Um, the first one, well, not two statements, but the most common ones are just two statements, and everything else is an expression. Even a for loop can be an expression. A if is an expression. A match or a match pattern is an expression itself. So, and uh, the first expression is probably most common is the let binding, which is, which is not a way just to define variables, and we'll see some examples later, but it's also a, a pattern matching by itself. And the second one is the semicolon that you would use to end some expression and say, like, would you don't want to return any value from it. It is static with local inference. Uh, it has some a basic implementation of the Milner's algorithm but with some uh, changes in it uh, to match what, uh, what we need in, in, the, in the language. 
is a linear type system, like I said. It has a whole bunch of other things, in, in, like built-in concurrency, memory safety, and a, a whole bunch of other features that we'll probably discuss later uh, in this talk. So let's start by, by talking about memory safety. How does the language guarantee memory safety? And we'll go from memory safety to why is memory safety important and talk about live systems and then why live systems are important and why uh, we care about them and, and the aliasing that is behind the, those lifetimes or regions, if you will. And that will uh, conclude in something that is a type sound, uh, the type sense and soundness, which is very important for, for the language. So this is a very uh, tiny example, like literally tiny. I hope you can read that uh, back there. And Passing something by reference just lends the value. This is very important. So the easiest way to explain Russ Lang's ownership process uh, or control is to have an analogy, and this is an, uh, this analogy was created by uh, like Nicholas Mataki. He's he's part of the core team. He he came up with this analogy to explain how the ownership process works in OpenStack, and this is the same in Russ Lang, not OpenStack. Jesus Christ. Uh, so it works the same way it, it would work for you to uh, lend someone else a book. If you have a friend and you have a book and you can read it because it's yours, and then you want someone else to just access that information, you can lend the book and that person will then read the book and you won't be able to access the book because you lent it, right? Someone else has it. You don't have uh, access to that book. So that's a reference and you're, expect, you're expecting it to, to to come back to you at some point. So you're just passing a reference and you're expecting the book to come back to you at some point so you will have full control on the book again. Um, instead, you can also give it away and that's what we call, and we'll see an example of that, where, when you're giving ownership away, when you have a value and you are the owner of that value and then you just pass it to another function or you just uh, put in another slot in the stack and then you're basically giving the whole value away which means you cannot do anything else on that value. You just gave it away. It's like if I give you a book and I give it away, I just like it's a gift for you. I wouldn't be ever uh, be able to access that book anyway, any, anymore. So you can see like we have the lead binding that I told you about. Uh, mute basically means that that slot there is mutable. Like I said, everything is immutable by default. And if you want to have a slot that is actually mutable and do some other things on that slot, uh, you have to mark it as immutable. And then, okay, we have a five allocated in the stack. And then we call that one, and that one gets a mutable reference. Note that there's a mutable reference. It's not just a reference to a mutable slot. We need to tell the compiler that that reference we're giving away, that reference we're passing to the add one, is a mutable reference. We are allowing add one to do something on that value we're passing there. This is very important because there's a huge difference in Ross Lang on how. Normal reference and mutable references are handled. Like normal reference are aliased, mutable reference are unaliased, which means you cannot have several mutable reference uh, being passed around because that would be unsafe. Because you're basically giving permission to more places to just access uh, the value and mutate it. And then, well, once add, add one is is done, uh, you know, like the ownership will go back. Like we 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 lent it as a mutable reference and then as soon as add one completes the discussion, we can do something else with the value and that's the print LN that is right down there. How much time do you use? Okay, so, uh, so we have box new, add one here. So box is what I told you, like you remember the tilde, uh, that sigil, that's box. That's a unique pointer that's more pointed that is pointing to something that is allocated in the heap and we are uh, you can see that we have a mute MUT num. We're basically saying that slot there, the, that argument in that function, that slot there has to be mutable, which is very different to passing a mutable reference. Remember, a slot can be mutable or immutable, and the reference itself can be mutable or immutable as well. Uh, so we're passing box as a value, and we're giving it away. And if we try to print it, the compiler will complain, and it will tell you, hey, you just gave that value away. You cannot use it. And it is protecting you from dangling pointers where you would access something that goes out of scope. And the reason it goes out of scope is because you passed uh, ownership to the add one function. And as soon the, as, as soon as the add one function completes, uh, that memory will be freed up. Because the scope where it belongs now uh, has just ended. You pass the value to the add one. And as soon as add one completes or ends, 
the, the value you pass there will go out of scope and it will be freed up. So this is another example, and you can see here we have uh, let x equals five, and you have add one, and we're passing it to add one, and then we can actually we can also print it, and then you say, well, but wait a minute, like you just said, if I'm not passing a reference, we are giving the value away, which means we don't own it anymore, which basically means we cannot use it anymore after that call, right? But turns out the compiler is smart is smarter than that. Uh, we, uh, you can mark something as copyable, and when something is copyable, the compiler will copy it in memory when you're passing it as a value, so you don't have to, um, you know, give it away and, and reallocate the whole uh, memory again. And this is a shallow copy, basically. Something that is copyable, I mean, let's start by saying this is not magic. I mean, this is a compiler, this is a type system and the trait system working together on making something copyable. So basically, you have a trait, and you can mark something, and we'll see the example later, you can mark something as copyable, and the compiler will recognize that trait has been implemented for that type, for that specific type, and it will copy the value. And, and it does that by using a shallow copy, like, like you would do in C, basically. It just calls main CPI, basically, and, and it copies the value, and it will copy the pointers. It, it, would, it won't recurse down to the pointers and copy all the values. It will just copy the first level. And all that is like the type system is parametrically polymorphic, and and it, it's not just uh, it does not it does not just has that simple polymorphism, and it also has bounded polymorphism, which basically means that you have some a type system that is parametric, but you can also have bounds on it. You can also say tell the compiler, hey, you know what, uh, the types that you're going to pass me here. I want them to have this basic implementation. I want them to not just be, let's call it subclasses of this type here, but I want them all to implement these traits here. And since we have uh, an algebraic type system, we basically can just sum up some types and come up with something more complex when we are building bounds. And here's a simple example. Uh, the T is the generic. And after the colon, you have all the types or, or, or the traits that had to be implemented. For, for for the bound to to hold, and where where u is some other type, like we have a, a built-in send trait, and the send trait basically means that something can be sent from a task from a thread to another thread safely. That uh, like I said, everything about Roslang is is to guarantee safety, and it does that using a type system. So if you have two threads, and you want to pass ownership of some specific value from a thread A to a thread B. That value has to be sendable. Sendable means that passing the whole ownership, like co moving completely the memory from one place to another, from one thread to another, is safe. It can, it can, it can be done for that specific type. Whereas the sync trait means that you, uh, something can be accessed from two different threads safely. There's no data raised. When you mark something as, as sync, you're basically telling the compiler, hey, is it safe to access this type here from two different threads and it is data race free. So note that all these traits here are opt-in. They used to be, they, I mean, they didn't used to be opt-in um, before. Like the compiler would just introspect the types and, 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 and all the fields of your types and it will determine when something was sendable or not. Like if you own completely, if you completely own the values that are held in, uh, within your type, so you have a struct with uh, a couple of fields and you own all those values, you can easily send it and the compiler will just mark your stuff as sendable. Um, but now all these things are opting we, um, so that you can tell the compiler yourself when something is sendable because you're know, you know your types and you know what you're, what you're writing or you're supposed to. And, and like the last example, we are basically telling the compiler you know what, this type here has to be sync and copy, and that means that it can be accessed from two different threads safely, but it can also be copied from a place to another place um, yeah, by simply, you know, calling memspy. Um, and if you read that, that basically means something is sendable. I, I can access it from two different threads, but I can also copy it from one place to another. I can basically move the data. So I'm telling the compiler, in other words, that something is sendable. Yeah, that's all built in. That's all built in. All these traits here, 
except the U, which is just a simple example. All these all these th traits here are built in in the compiler. Um, for the copy case, though, uh, the compiler will try to determine when something is copyable and will mark it as copyable. It will implement the, the trait itself for you. Um, when, for example, for uh, like normal types like f integers or uh, um, un unsigned integers or charts and that kind of things are easily copyable from one place from a place in memory to another place. Uh, the compiler will do that for you, and we'll see an example of of how this works. Uh, so this is a very simple example. Struct my type. Uh, this is a struct, and we have two generics there. Very simple. I, I didn't expand it because uh, you would just just imagine you have some fields in there that are using those generics, right? I didn't want to go really deep in there. Uh, and there's a, a struct that is using the, the copy bound, and you're basically telling the type of this generic here has to implement copy. It has to be copyable because I want my struct to be copyable as well. So I don't want you to, creating, to, to be creating new objects of my struct with something that is not copyable because I want my struct to be copyable, basically. And like I said, we'll see a better example of that. And this is, again, a function also has generics. You can also have generics on your functions. And it, has, it says that the type uh, of your generic has to implement show and copy as well. So we saw that. We already saw uh, references. We saw mutable references. And you might be wondering, like, if I have a normal reference, if I'm passing a reference, can I just simply copy it everywhere and pass it everywhere uh, without any, I mean, carelessly? And you cannot, there's a, another part of the type system, if you will, uh, that takes care of the life of everything that you pass around. And if you pass a reference, that reference has, is pointing to something that will die at some point. And that's what we call lifetimes. We determine how long something will live in the execution of your program so that we can know when, uh, where you can pass it and when it has to be cleaned up. And these lifetimes here are not, uh, are not a new concept. It was not created by, uh, by the Rosalind team. Uh, they're called regions in other places or scopes in some others. But the scope is very limited compared to what a region or a lifetime does. Um, and again, a simple, very simple example. We have a struct foo. And, and the way you name a lifetime is by using the quote and a ident after it. And in the case of the struct, you have quote A. That's the lifetime A. And you use that lifetime to uh, specify the type of the value e of the field X. And you're basically saying every value that, is, uh, that will be used here to, to create a new object of this uh, struct foo has to live uh, as long as uh, the lifetime A, or shorter than that. And you can see in the function main, you have let X which is defined outside this scope here. And then you have let y, which takes a reference to 5. You uh, create a new instance. We don't call it instance and runs, but just to make it simpler. Uh, you create a new instance of foo, and you pass y there. And you're probably wondering, uh, so you just said that the field x has to have a lifetime a. And you are just passing a, a reference to 5 without any, like, named lifetime. Uh, so that's, that's lifetime illusion. We have lifetime illusion in, in Rosalind. So you don't have to write the lifetime for everything. Uh, the compiler will infer it for you. It will try to determine what's the uh, right lifetime for you in that case. And in this case, the lifetime of 5 will be the same lifetime of foo, which is the lifetime of this context here. So as soon as this context here ends, all those values will be freed up from memory, and those references will, won't be va valid anymore. So the compiler determines the lifetime for you, and it says, OK, you're using uh, so foo and, and the reference to phi uh, live, uh, uh, live long enough to be combined, basically. Like phi won't outlive foo in, in any case. So you can create a new instance of foo, and then you try to get a reference of x. Uh, on the x on the x uh, variable that you defined before outside the scope, and then the compiler gets mad and says, "Wait a minute! Like you're taking a reference to an x value, which is a field of foo, which lives lo uh, shorter uh, than um, uh, than uh, the the x variable that you define outside the scope. So when you try to do that, 
uh, the compiler will tell you that x does not live long enough to be assigned to that x value there. So this is an example to show you that you cannot just pass references around uh, everywhere as you wish. The compiler will protect you from having dangling pointers again, from having references to things that uh, don't exist anymore in memory. And obviously, you won't be ever able to print that x. Uh, uh, this is a crash course into lifetimes. Lifetimes are way more complex than these, and these like we many people just get stuck in lifetime for for a couple of weeks before they can just like get their heads uh, around it. And but but again, like it's a very simple example to to express how it works. If we apply that to functions and have lifetimes in functions, and you know the the arguments of the functions can have lifetimes as well, it gets more complex. But I'll leave you that as an assignment for you. We don't have enough time. So mutability. We have talked about uh, how ownership works in Roslang. We have talked about how lifetimes work in Roslang. So what's, what's all these fools about you know, ownership and lifetimes and aliasing of references? And, and it turns out that we need that to have a, a good story about mutability and how you can mutate some values. And we, one of the things you probably are wondering or not is, is this the only, I mean, is linearly the only way I can mutate something in, in Roslang? Is like passing a value linearly to some function or some other place is the only way that I have to mutate something in Roslang? It's, it is not. Uh, you can also have inherited mutability, or you can also have, um, what's the, only, the other one? I forgot the completely the name. Uh, let's keep going here. So uh, in this case here, this is a, the previous example uh, we saw. And, and here you, have a, you are passing a value linearly to a function and then where you can mutate it. And then you have inherited mutability where you have a struct that has a field in it and a value. And then you, you move that structure to a slot that is mutable. Note that we define, like we create an instance of that struct in a um, x slot, which is immutable. And then we assign that x slot into something that is immutable, which is the z slot. And in, when we do that, we're basically telling, you know what? So this is mutable now. And x, is, x at the point, like when, when let mut z is executed, x has given completely its ownership on the value it used to have. So now that my struct belongs to the z slot. And that basically means that you can now mutate it. And that's inherited mutability, because you can mutate the internal values of that, of that uh, type, because it is mutable already. So, and the other one is internal mutability. That's the other one. Um, very simple example. That's a cell there is built in in the language. Uh, that you have cell and you also have res, ref cells. And, and very briefly, like cell is the way you would just wrap a primitive type that is completely copyable so that you can mutate it internally. And the example is there, like you have a cell, it wraps a five, which is a primitive type, and then you can say, hey, you know what, cell, I want to change your value, and I want, you, I want to mutate you internally, and I will just pass you a new value, and you will now be uh, six instead of, uh, of five. Um, this seems very silly. There are other things interesting about cells, that you can do reference a cell, which basically gives you the value, and it also has auto dereference, which will do that for you automatically. And if you use ref cells, you can do something more fancy because it is, uh, I mean, it's a ref cell. If reference counted, so you can have more complex values in there that are not copyable, but that can be accessed from other threads as well uh, safely. Like I said, like ref cell would be seen. So again, what's all this fuss about mutability, aliasing, all that kind of things? It's not just because we want to. Uh, ha like it's not because Jerusalem wants to have a fancy type system. It's because we need that to guarantee soundness in the type system. What does soundness mean? It means that uh, every time you implement something, every time you, you write something and using the type system, it will hold. Uh, you can read it completely, and everything that you're reading will hold at the, uh, the moment of the execution. Note that Roslang, uh, the fact that Roslang doesn't have any garbage collection or other things. So, Roslang doesn't want, does not want to have any dependency on a runtime. Uh, it would be unfair to say it doesn't have any kind of runtime, but it definitely can run on, on the machine level. Um, 
or the same levels that you would execute C or C++. Uh, so it does not have any dependency on garbage collection or runtime, so everything has to be done by the compiler itself, and it has to protect you from doing dumb things at runtime. And all these things are needed to guarantee uh, the soundness of the type system. For example, un alias mutable references basically means that you cannot have two mutable references to the same value because that would allow you to have data races and that would allow you to mutate the same uh, memory space in two from two different places. And you, can obviously, you, you cannot obviously copy something that has a mutable reference because you would, you would be copying the mutable reference. Like I said, remember that when something is copied, it is a shallow copy, it just calls a mcpy, which basically means it is copying the pointer, it is not copying the value. And if you try to implement copy for something that has a mutable reference, so you have your struct full uh, lifetime because you need a lifetime for, for the reference, and you say, you know, foo will have, like the x value will have a mutable reference to a integer 32. And then you try to implement copy for foo, and the compiler will complain, it will tell you, you know what, you have a mutable reference, I cannot implement copy for something that has a mutable reference, because that means I can copy it everywhere, and that will be unsound for, for the type system. So, and this would obviously compile. Uh, we remove the mutable reference. We just have a, we just have a reference there, uh, which can be aliased and can be copied everywhere. And it would be safe to do that because the, the compiler knows how long uh, the, the x value will live because it has a lifetime. So it does not matter if the compiler copies it around and you pass it around because the compiler knows how long it will live and it will prevent you from having a point to something that uh, does not live long enough. But, okay, enough about the, ty the type system. Now, I added a couple of more slides to make it more, uh, hopefully, fun, and explain some, some of the internal things that are more functionally, probably. Uh, like I said, it does not have any HKTs, so things like fun, uh, fancier things like functors and things that depend on HKTs cannot be implemented in the language yet. However, it does have a lot of functional, and one of them is pattern matching. It's very, very powerful in the language. Uh, this is very simple. Um, I'm full of simple examples, damn it. Uh, so you have an enum, which is, uh, like I said, it's algebraic, it's very similar. Uh, so you have two variants there. You have a value which can have an I, I, I32 and you have a missing, call it maybe if you want. Uh, and then you can have a match on that. Um, enums are namespaced, so you need to write the whole thing. They didn't used to be like that, but now they are namespaced for, because if you are importing something, if you are importing a crate in another crate, you will have some uh, namespace clashes or everything. So they are namespaced, you have opting column column value five, and you, are, you have a match in that. And then you have all the arms of your match, and you can say like the first one uh, will be executed if A is bigger than five, and the second one will be executed if uh, for all the other values, and the third one will be executed just if, if the variant is missing. And I mean the missing variant, not the variant is missing, literally. Um, so uh, patterns matches are exhaustive in Rustline. You have to have all the variants written there. And if you don't, you, you, have, you have all the underscore, which is basically a wildcard, and say, like, put everything else in here. And, but you need, to have, you need to have exhaustive matches. And this is something built in in the language, which allows you to reason better about your code and know what, what you're handling and what cases you're not handling. And the compiler will protect you from, from doing dumb things in that case. And something interesting about this is that that A there is actually moving the value. Uh, so the internal value, like the, you know, like opt-in value has a five, which is an I32, and the A there, this A here, is actually the moved value from the matched uh, pattern up there. And this is interesting because if you have a match on a reference, you will have a reference in your arm, and you need to uh, destructure it, like you need to dereference it to, thank you. To, to access the actual value. So there are interesting things about uh, the patterns in, in Roslan. This is another thing. Uh, you can also have bindings within your match. 
So in this case, you have x, which is equal 5, and then you have match x. And in the first arm, you have um, i at 1 dot 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 5. That basically means that's a range. And you're saying if the x is in this range here, this arm will be executed. And the value of that x will be bound to i. And, and for all the other cases, this wildcard here, the underscore, uh, will be executed. So iterators. Iterators are iterators. The iterator is actually a trait in the language. It is built in. It has a whole bunch of functions that are interesting for wh whenever you want to iterate over something. And here, I'm, I'm going to name some some of the most common ones in, in functional world. But note that they're very different from the ones that you are used to. They are not functors. They are plain implementations uh, using normal methods and and Roslang uh, type system. Something interesting, though, is that all these functions here are lazy. So they would not allocate it. They will not be executed as soon as you write them unless you collect the whole iterator, unless you iterate over uh, the freaking iterator. And, and like I said, they are lazy, and they won't allocate more memory for you. They will stream everything in the whole chain. So this is very important, because they might not be f as fancy as a functor is, but they are very smart for you. Uh, this is uh, okay. This is a fold. Everyone knows what a fold does, I hope. And uh, if not, I'm not going to explain it right now. <laughs> so you have a fold there. Very simple. Uh, it is readable. Like you have the first value, and the second one is a closure. Yes, we have closures. Just in case you were wondering, and there are unboxed closures. Uh, this is a filter. So this one. Uh, sorry, this one here won't be executed because we're not collecting the data anyway. Uh, this is a filter, and we're iterating there, filtering out some values, like the, the ones that are not even. And this is a map. Same rules apply. We all know what map is, and I'm not going to explain it. No, just kidding. Uh, uh, the same rules for iterators apply here. Uh, they're lazy. You have to iterate over the whole iterator to actually execute the map. So if you have a, if you have an, an, an iterable and you call map and you don't call collect and you put a closure in there with a print without collecting the whole data, and I, when I say collect, it's because there's actually a method called collect that you can call. And, and if you don't call it, uh, the, the closure itself won't be executed. So you can chain it if you want. You can uh, build a chain of filters and maps and folds and everything. To have more complex, yes. You can definitely access a reference of that iterator as soon as you don't have, as soon as you don't move the data. And and the the whole thing, the the problem there is whether you want to access it, uh, when, whether you want to access a mutable reference to the iterator or whether you are moving the data. As, soon, as long as, to put it simple, as long as you're just accessing a reference to that iterator, you can do it. Does that make sense? Oh, for sure? OK. I mean, think you have an iterator, and you have a filter there. And that iterator is defined in somewhere else, in an x variable. And you want to pass a reference to that x variable to your closure. You can do that as long as that reference there is not mutable, or as long as that it's a, it's just a reference, a readable reference. You cannot pass the value because if you move the value, the iterator won't be able to actually iterate over the data. Well, I mean, the compiler won't let you do that. But logically, if you, if the compiler won't protect you from that, uh, you wouldn't be able to actually access the data because you moved it into the closure. No. Okay. That is that better? Okay. Cool. Uh, thread, mutex, channel. Uh, well, this is probably just a leftover from, from the previous version of, uh, of this talk. And this is just the yeah, single slide. Uh, because Erlang has it, I wanted to put this slide here, actually. So you can, and you know, Golang also has it. Uh, but Golang, let's not talk about Golang. Um, so you have channels. You can communicate between threads. 
and these channels are implemented in a multi-producer, single consumer way. So you can have many things, many threads producing data and just a single consumer from that channel. But this is just a built-in implementation. You can also build your own channel, thank you, your own channel with your own implementation and have a multiple consumer and all that things. So this is all done because we have traits that tell the compiler how this channel or how this mechanism should work. And we have ARC, all this is done using uh, built-in types that you can find in the standard library. ARC is an atomic reference counted type, which means that everything that goes in there is reference counted atomically, so you can access it safely and you can mutate it safely because it will protect you from uh, doing dumb things. And it is sendable and you can clone the channels. So as, okay, this is important, like you have the copy thread trait that basically tells the compiler when something can be copied, but you also have the clone trait which tells the compiler when something can be cloned completely. So it won't just copy, uh, it won't just do a shallow copy, but you can also, this is your way to create uh, movable constructors in your, style, in your type if you want. Uh, you call clone on the type you're passing and then you will get a whole new value and a whole full copy of that, of that type there. So we're doing that here. In data, we're cloning data, which is the arc. And like I said, this is a reference counted. So when you, when you clone that, you're cloning the arc, not the internal value, um, which allows you, like I said, to access it from different threads at the same time. And you, have, you are cloning also the sendable part of your channel. This is a thread. So threads in Roslang used to be green threads, and that was changed to system threads. They were used, uh, they were used we used to call them tasks, and they are now threats for the sake of consistency and clarity with the rest of the world. Um, a range for this, it's a pretty, again, simple example. And this is a movable closure. This basically says that this closure here can be moved safely uh, because the whole environment is completely owned by the closure, and moving it to some other task won't uh, end up in some data arrays or memory corruptions on or unsafe operations. And I hope you were not bored. That's everything. That's all I have. And if you have any questions, feel free to fire up or thank you very much for being here. Uh, so you talked about safety being a big focus. How does Rust's compiler stack up against some of the recent vulnerabilities that we've seen that are around safety and memory? Uh, so, for example, we've had um, vulnerabilities in programs written in C involving memory safety and so on that have been big security uh, problems. Would they have been caught if those programs had been written in Rust? Uh, so, yes, yeah, some of them, yes, or most of them. So, Roslang uh, guarantees data race safety. It does not guarantee other kind of, you know, race conditions. It just makes sure that your data and the memory you have allocated is safely managed. So, you don't have dangling pointers, you have, like, unfreed memory and that kind of things. Uh, so, yes, it has bound protection uh, enabled by default and overflows and underflows protections as well. So yes, most of them, like SSLs, box, I, I guess you're talking about them. Yes, most of them would, would not have existed if you would have had Rust Lang back then. So there are, there's already an SSL kind of implementation uh, written or being written in, in Rust Lang. Uh, let's see how that works. But definitely the compiler was created to, to guarantee that kind of safety. So you don't have to you know, worry about that. Does that answer your question? Okay, cool. Questions? No. Oh, two. First one. We have a, a good control over the lifetime of um, data. And what uh, we don't ne decide to have the lifetime, the compiler know how, to, uh, how long is the life of, uh, of data. 
So why we need a garbage collector? You don't need it. That's the whole point. Uh, so you don't have a garbage collector in the language. You don't have it. Uh, everything is, a, is done by the compiler itself at compile time. So you don't even depend on the runtime to tell you, hey, you know what, this should be free. The compiler will do that at compile time. And when it translates the code from uh, Roslang to LLVM, it uses LLVM uh, to LLVM ER, it will do everything for you directly. And it will call the, the right drops and things for free memory. And the subsequent question is, uh, uh, did you choose mm, the sort of the wrong Lang uh, team choose uh, not to have uh, um, garbage collector or any form of um, automation on uh, the malloc uh, of, uh, of pointers uh, uh, because uh, of uh, performance enhancing or mm, design, uh, religion? Uh, religion, of course. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, a bit of everything, honestly. Uh, there's a performance impact on having a garbage collector uh, because it depends on the runtime, and the language does not want to depend on the runtime. And and uh, some of the uh, some the good example of that is the fact that you can build a kernel using Roslang, and there are many like toy projects that do kernel development using Roslang. Uh, there's a bit of religion. Uh, because the compiler does that for you, so it does not make sense to have it internally. And another reason is that garbage collection is actually very hard to get right. And, and uh, you know, like the whole team has been fighting for a stable release for a long time. And having a garbage collector and within the language would have been like very complex to, you know, to, to get right at the, at the very beginning. And I'm not saying it won't ever happen in the language. I'm just saying it was just like the responsibility of the garbage collection was just left out to a library. So you can just implement it yourself if you want. By yourself, I mean it could be the Rust team or it could be the community itself. So it's a bit of everything. It's a bit of religion and definitely a lot of performance, like I said. It, it, the language does not want to depend on the runtime. And garbage collection has an impact on, per on performance, definitely. Uh, some of the features that you described, um, from my uh, not very much experience to the point of view, um, look a little bit of an overlap uh, with software transactional memory. Do you have uh, any comparison, can be any comparison made between software transactional memory and the uh, memory handling uh, facilities that you described? Um. There's an overlap from, if you look at it uh, from the point of the safety and the things it allows you to do from a concurrent point of view, there's definitely some overlap. But there are completely different implementations uh, at the lower level. Uh, whether there will be some uh, built-in handling for STM in, in Roslang, I, I do not know. I have no, like I personally, I mean my, myself are not interested in, in having it in the language right now and I haven't heard any of it uh, from the rest of the team. Uh, so. There's, like I said, there's definitely some overlap from, from you know, the concurrent point of view if you see how Roslyn protects you and allows you to do some things that STM would allow you to as well. Um, there's definitely some overlap, but they're completely different implementations. Like they have nothing to do with it. Like this thing here is just type system analysis. Like Roslyn does this by not touching the memory. It just reads what you have written and it will tell you, you know what, you're not making any sense. And you know, like this thing here that you just wrote, it, you cannot do it because if you do it, you'll just shoot yourself on the foot. There's another last question. Do you have any protection from deadlocks? Ta -da. <laughs> uh, we kind of ish used to have. We don't have it right now anymore. But we're working on, I mean, part of the team, not right now, obviously, but it is in our minds, basically, to, uh, to work on something that would protect you from deadlocks. Uh, deadlocks are definitely more complex, because that, that basically means that the compiler has to have knowledge about the mutex, which right now, mutex for the compiler are just you know, traits. 
they are just types. It doesn't have internal knowledge of that, whereas it does have internal knowledge of what a copy trait does or what a copy trait means. And we used to have some kind of protection to deadlocks, and we just got it wrong. And we decided to, uh, you know, instead of having something that is not working properly, uh, you know, like it's better to just provide uh, data protection, and then we'll work on something that, um, or part of the team will work on something that does deadlock protection in the future, when the compiler will be smarter, hopefully. Okay, thank you, Flavio.